Something else that set Johnny Quest apart is an animated series with a true sense of place, of an authentic geography, because the Quest traveled around the world. As a result, the globetrotting plot lines gave the show a super cool and very international feel. The score also seemed to take great delight in the different locales as well, and there was a cavalcade of not just foreign lands and people, but of their indigenous wildlife as well. business with race naturally but I might ask you the same question again taking a cue from Milt Caniff's comic strip Jade was the quest version of the dragon lady from Terry and the Pirates the dragon lady like race and Jade had a complex and unpredictable relationship with the show's heroes race you're not very complimentary you've been in Hong Kong three days and the first time I see you is when dr. quest gets himself kidnapped do you think I had something to do with it? No, Jade, I didn't say that. But you'd never turn down an opportunity to add to your bank account. I have expensive taste race, but I almost never kidnap my friends. For money, that is. In the world of Johnny Quest, Jade's relationship with Race Bannon spoke to not just a backstory. There's only one race banner. But the suggestion of an erotic life for these two animated characters on 60s TV. Money with me, but uh, how about this for a down payment? That's a good lesson for us, Haji. When we grow up, everything's going to be strictly cash. Doug said that the Johnny Quest show had good writers, but not at first. He said most of the early writers hired by Hannah and Barbara were still trying to make a Popeye cartoon out of the Quest adventures. Then they started hiring writers from television, radio, and movies, and the quality of the scripts reflected this. If there was a script that came in that I didn't like, Wildey said, then it would get changed. And that way, I had control if that's even the right word to use, because Doug also reported that usually Joe Barbera, or Barbera and the writer, would work out the problems until the story, to use Doug Wildey's own words, was something I could get jazzed up about and could start storyboarding. In the villains, as well as in some of the stories, there were oftentimes something unique and inspired. Do you understand? Like the wheelchair-bound Dean, who somehow had ended up in the Amazon with the prehistoric Pteranodon. You will hunt the intruders tomorrow. Not only still alive, but as his pet and protector. Come now. Whatever this unspoken backstory is, it points out the wonderful imagination behind a great deal of the shows. Writer William D. Hamilton penned the Turu the Terrible script, as well as many others of the 26. Bill Hamilton was a writer-director, first for movies and then for an anthology show called Lucky Strike Theater back in the 50s. Another writer who came on to Quest, Walter Black, wrote for I Spy, Gilligan's Island, Rawhide, Bonanza, Gunsmoke, Hawaii Five-O, and the Streets of San Francisco. 
Doug says he did control about 19 of the eventual 26 scripts for the series, but many of the scripts that he did not like got by him and became episodes. The title of the episode, The Chu Sing Ling Caper, may seem strange at first, but this was the script for the episode that eventually became Terror Island. The script has lots of pencil changes in the margin. But oh boy, I never thought these things could go so fast. Yippee! But I can only assume belong to Joe Barbera. I think it's getting hazy again. No! The finished episode and the teleplay had interesting differences. For instance, the actual episode, where a giant crab wreaks havoc, was not in the script anyway. Another change was a character named Captain Spaulding, who in the finished episode was gone altogether. No, Haji, that's just what we can't do. Read this. Do not call police or Dr. Quest die. What can we do then? And his lines divided up between race and Haji. Doug describes the writing for Quest now as top-notch, some of the best ever, if not the best still, for TV animation. To give an example, my favorite episode of Johnny Quest, Monster in the Monastery. A storm drives the legendary Yeti down from the high Himalayas into an old abandoned palace. There's the old palace of Kali Yuga. But the visiting quests are reluctant to believe that these legendary creatures are anything more than local superstition. This is a pleasant surprise, Dr. Quest, but you have come at a difficult time. The Yeti have invaded the old palace. That night, when Johnny and Haji chase Bandit into the old palace, the boys discover that the Yeti are not only fake, He's better looking with a head on. But the imposters are actually political enemies of the Raj Guru, there to stage a terrorist coup. On the balcony! Get them! <laughs> After a third act of Cat and Mouse, from spaceship number three. I hope you boys have a good excuse. Well, uh, I'll try to think of one, Dad. There are enough Yeti outfits and supplies here to equip a small army. Well, Dr. Quest, would you and Raj Guru step out here on the balcony? Trouble race? Uh, no, sir, not now. But someone's been playing pretty rough. Looks like they've all been wiped out by some tremendous force. A terrible justice has been done here. I wonder by whom. Dad! Hey, Dad! Look! Tracks! And they lead up the hill. There's something up on that ridge. What is it, Johnny? I don't know. Would you call that, Dr. Quest? I see it, but I hardly dare believe it. You can believe it, Dr. Quest. The Yeti have taken vengeance into their own hands. <laughs> Making this the most atypical, eerie, and unsettling ending of all the Quest episodes. Because the DVD release decided to slap the same and wrong end title on almost every Quest episode, I feel it's only right to take 30 seconds to see who really wrote and directed these shows.
Meet Stretch Bannon, a Sunday comic strip Doug created about a race car driver and his young sidekick named Chip. Another strip he created was about a detective named Eddie Race. If these two wildy characters can be thanked for anything, it's for leaving their surnames behind for one of Doug's coolest creations. Doug Wildey said that the character of Race Bannon was fashioned after a popular tough guy actor of that time named Jeff Chandler. Start the probe arm. Negative, chum. If you think I'm letting you walk off with five years' research, think again. You laugh at bullets, American? Not at bullets, at you. Who's going to operate the prober if you shoot me? Who mentioned shooting you? But your young friend here, that is a different matter. Now, would you reconsider your decision? Don't give in to him, Race. I have to, Johnny. Your dad expects me to take care of you. Can't let him down, can we? Race was voiced by actor Mike Rode, who looked so much like a real-life Race Bannon, all that was missing was his white hair. Mike was primarily a TV actor with a deep, velvet-smooth voice doing westerns and mostly guest shots on shows like Bewitched. Stevens, the charge is grand theft. And I intend to see that Franklin, or whoever he is, is prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Now watch as we apply that same voice to a shot of Race Bannon from an episode of Quest. Stevens, the charge is grand theft. And I intend to see that Franklin, or whoever he is, is prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Doug Wildey said he chose Mike Rode from a large number of actors because Rode had a Clark Gable-like delivery, a sardonic, dry wit approach to lines that Doug wanted for Johnny Quest's toughest character. Doug liked to give an example of trying to get everyone on board with who Race Bannon was by rewriting lines for him. In the pilot, when the script called for Johnny to be threatened by several lizard men, the written line for Race was, Hang on, Johnny. Doug rewrote it in the style that is pure Race Bannon. Hang on, kid. Cavalry to the rescue. These kinds of lines, and Race himself, who had his birth in the classic comic books and strips of Wildy's childhood, came to full fruition in the voice of Race Bannon, the sardonic wit of a man who cracked wise in the face of danger. What is that? Oh, that. That's the oven timer. The cake's all baked. He thinks to make fools of us, Colonel. Negative again, Bob. Nature beat me to it. Mike Rhodes' voice came out of quite a few Johnny Quest supporting cast. Mike did what were called multiples for various episodes. That's when one actor who is being paid for an eight-hour day and gets his half-hour episode recorded in an hour is then used to play other parts that also need voicing. Here is a random sampling of Mike's not-so-disguised Bannon-like tones doing other characters on the show. I'm sorry, sir. They're just too fast for us. Hey, I have trapped one of them. That's the quest group. They're all waving. Everything must be okay. I'm trying, Ivar. I'm trying. But I must get the key to the laboratory when the professor isn't there. And he's expecting a visitor. An American scientist, a Dr. Quest. Here he is, sir. Odd-looking fish, isn't he? Captain, I have a UFO that comes and goes. Wait. Oh! Are we far from my father, White Feather? Pretty far. When Grey One come, we leave. Go fast. Boy with hair like snow and with red stone in head. Must run like warrior. Doug Wildey claims to have done most of the voice casting for Johnny Quest. And if this is true, this is another area where he truly excelled in the creation of Johnny and his adventures. For a government agent with a license to kill, Race also had his foot firmly in the salesmanship of the Johnny Quest show. When was the last time you heard your government bodyguard say something like, Johnny Quest, brought to you by New Lysol Spray. 
the disinfectant spray that eliminates household germs and odors instantly. New Lysol spray. Many talents and circumstances shape any collaborative work of art, whether it's a commercial work or not. For instance, Screen Gems, which was coming in as partners and financiers on Quest, sent their man in, pushing to make the show more about Race Bannon, though they didn't like the name Bannon and thought his last name should be Chase. Doug Wildey, not known for his soft-spoken diplomacy, vehemently and boisterously rejected all these ideas. And the man in the suit who wanted the show to be called Race Chase, Doug never heard from again. That name rings a bell. And it should. He's been mixed up in gun running, smuggling the works. Professor Gunderson. Gunderson, eh? Can we talk with him? I'm afraid not. Six months ago, Gunderson met an untimely death in an airplane accident in India. It wouldn't have been at Gallipo, would it? Why, yes, Race, that's exactly where it was. Well, put two and one together. Two crooks and one professor. And it adds up to something Intelligence One should look into. That man has always found ways to alter his emotions by consuming various plants. It's called hallucinogenics. Yes, doctor. Unfortunately, the use of this could be abused, which is why the formula must be guarded. Yes, doctor. I want that formula. <laughs> Everybody. They'll attack anything if they're angry enough. for the door. I'll cover it. They've really got us pinned down, Race. Help yourself to a rifle. Get them! Shoot them down! Get them! Keep splashing, Charlie!
is Grace. What's he up to? We'll soon find out. Just wait. Get a good look at a Kizio. Dr. Quest, I'll be back later. Take it easy. And you savages better lay off, or I'll take your village apart stick by stick. What's he up to? We'll soon find out. Just wait. All right, you ignorant savages. Get a good look at a Kizio, you heathen monkeys. design for Dr. Benton Quest is sometimes traced back to this character he drew years earlier when he took over the comic strip The Saint. Whether or not that early strip was the doctor's true origin, Benton Quest was not just a national treasure, but one of the world's most brilliant minds. Brilliant enough for the government to assign secret agent Race Bannon to guard, protect, and tutor the doctor's young son, Johnny. And while you're at it, look in on the boys, will you, Race? Anything else? No, I... Guard! Portside, quick! Guard! Who 
Who was it? Look at this. Of course, the doctor needed his share of protecting as well. As a very deadly calling card. Keep a sharp lookout, guard. Yes, sir. Interestingly enough, the relationship between Benton and son Johnny was probably the least explored dynamic of the show. One article on what is now called classic Johnny Quest pointed something out that I think merits attention. Though Benton Quest's love for his son and deep affection for Haji was never in question, it is interesting that Race oftentimes seemed more like a father to Johnny than the busy doctor who was always hard at work on new technology, helping to advance the country in the space race or otherwise involved in the world of science. The Quest family history was left a mystery. Is our man Race Bannon still assigned to guard the doctor's boy? 24 hours a day as tutor, companion, and all-around watchdog. You see, since Johnny lost his mother, the government is taking no chances with the boy's security. Security? Yes. You see, if Johnny fell into the hands of enemy agents, Dr. Quest's value to science would be seriously impaired. Doug Wildey said he saw no point in elaborating further on the family's backstory. It was, after all, an adventure show, and this kind of information was unnecessary to service the kind of stories they were setting out to tell. Though in one interview, he did mention that in retrospect, he might have done it differently in the wake of so many questions from so many fans over the years about what the real story of the quests was. The consequent reconfiguring of the quest mythos in the later series, The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest, and the Comico comic series that did present new details of these backstories can either be appreciated or discounted depending on your opinion of these later incarnations. To most die-hard Quest fans who grew up with those first 26 episodes, there will always be only one true Johnny Quest series. Actor John Stevenson provided the voice of Dr. Benton Quest. Stevenson was the voice at the end of every television episode of Dragnet, the one that gave the sentence and outcome of Joe Friday's cases. It would be an honor, Dr. Karim. But after episode six of Quest, it was decided that Stevenson sounded too similar to Mike Rhodes' Race Bannon, and for the remaining 20 episodes, Benton Quest was performed by legendary voice actor Don Messick, who, strange as it may seem, also provided Bandit with his bark. Messick did hundreds of voices for Hanna-Barbera over the years, including another equally famous cartoon canine. Ooh, 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 ooh. A true man of science, as well as a man of action, Benton Quest's work was decidedly humanitarian. When he wasn't inventing robots to put out oil well fires, he was busy designing machines like the underwater sea prober or an array of other cool gadgets that populated the series. technology Dr. Benton Quest created was about exploration. Even in the only episode where he was clearly working on a weapon for the government, it turned out to be the Para Power Ray Gun, an invention that rendered other weapons useless, but that spared human life. At the time of the show's conception, Joe Barbera had just seen the Bond film Dr. No 
and told Doug Wildey that he wanted a James Bond style feel to the show. And so the same man that envisioned color programming would become the future predicted correctly that the world of spies and high-tech gadgetry would soon find a popular home on television screens. Hanna-Barbera not only wanted Johnny Quest to be the forerunner of this prediction, but they wanted it to always feel cutting edge, no matter how many years the show might be rerun in syndication. Joe and Doug agreed that to keep the Quest show from ever feeling dated, they should incorporate as much future technology as they could. Doug said the rule was technology in the show had to be either plausible science or possible science. And so, much of the technology came from ideas they found in the publication Scientific American or Popular Science. Here we go again! You're going right into them! That's the general idea! Huh? Fasten your seatbelt! There is a final star that shines brightly in every episode of Johnny Quest. The music of White Curtain blazes through all 26 episodes of The Adventures of Johnny Quest and is probably the most consistent high mark throughout this wild experiment. All right, hold your fire. I guess it's up to race now. I hope he can come up with something. I'm gonna try something the hard way! Doug always said that the music for Johnny Quest was absolutely the best it could be, that perfectly captured the intent and style of the show. Here we go again! You're going right into them! That's the general idea! Huh? Fasten your seatbelt! Joe Barbera has often called composer Curtin a true musical genius. Almost every piece of underscore you have been hearing in this presentation has been from the nearly two hours of dazzling cues Hoyt Curtin wrote for Quest. Hoyt was born in Dewey, California, and at the age of five, when the family moved to Bernardino, took an interest in the piano. He played with several jazz bands and formed his own orchestra in high school. After serving in the Navy during World War II, Hoyt earned his master's degree in music at USC and began working in television commercials. After working with Hoyt on a Schlitz beer commercial where the composer came up with a jingle in a record five minutes time, Hannah and Barbara looked to him when they needed music for their first solo venture, Rough and Ready. They sometimes have their little spats, even fight like dogs and cats, but when they need each other, that's when they're rough and ready. When they asked him to turn to action and drama for Johnny Quest, Hoyt claims he simply winged an adventure theme. Ending art card, take one. Saying he simply winged it was typical of Hoyt Curtin's soft-spoken humility that masked his enormous talent. This was my impression of him when I had my own personal contact with him via his website shortly before his passing in 2000. Insert one, take one at bar 54. One, two, three. 
quite said the Quest music was performed by a regular jazz band consisting of four trumpets, six trombones, five woodwinds, and a five-man rhythm section, all of them top musicians at that time in Los Angeles. Recorded at RCA in Hollywood, Hoyt says he had to stay in the booth most of the time he was laughing so hard. As a challenge to the trombone players, and because of some ribbing they had given him about writing music that was too easy to play, in the main title of Johnny Quest, Hoyt wrote for the trombone in a way which forced the slide of the instrument to have to change positions too quickly from one extreme to the other, and it made it impossible to really play correctly. Maybe not to our ears, but the composers I have played the theme for says it is right here where the trombones can't hit all the notes as written correctly. Hoyt said that that was the best they could get it, and that he had a wonderful time watching his buddies, some of the best musicians in the biz, sweating and swearing as they tried to master this impossible trombone riff, and that take after take, as they got more and more red-faced and winded trying to hit all those notes, the situation got funnier and funnier. As is often the case with productions at Hanna-Barbera, the title bestowed on Curtin for his musical contributions never allowed him to take credit for actually composing and conducting his music. Never suggesting that the man ever composed a note of all that wonderful music. There is strong evidence that Hanna-Barbera seemed focused on keeping the spotlight on Bill and Joe, saving the lion's share of the credit for themselves, regardless of the enormous contributions of those they supervised. I just don't trust anyone who smiles all the time. There's something fishy about this. The big, brassy sound of the 60s had to be one of Hoyt Curtin's fortes, because the music for Yogi Bear... Yogi Bear is smarter than the average bear. Yogi Bear is always in the ranger's head. The Flintstones... Everything that came after included some of the most kick-ass, sparkling jazz riffs I have ever heard. A personal favorite is some of the trumpet parts in the end title of the Jetsons. He might have just winged it, but that wonderful jazzy jackhammer brass that got your blood boiling and your heart pumping at still sounds to me like no composer before or since. Doug said that originally having actual monsters make appearances in the Quest shows was his idea because he was always looking for a way to what he called pump things up. For me, your humble narrator, I'd like to go on record saying that most of my favorite episodes were the monster episodes. But I have been a monster fan from my earliest memories. Intruders are escaping. They must be intercepted. Do you hear me? Wildey said that he preferred human villains because, again, they were more believable. With the exception of Dr. Zinn. The Quest's arch enemy was Doug's least favorite human villain because he thought the mad scientist trying to dominate the world was a bad cliché that, like Bandit the Dog, took away from the show's credibility. Well, Dr. Quest is taking the bait, just as I wanted. <laughs> You're fool, Dr. Zinn. You brainless fool! Get out! And if you ever come in here again without knocking, I'll have you flogged. Now get out! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I gave them a new god. Now they worship me. <laughs> My 
My Voodoo Strong Medicine Beware of Luke Garo. I have a theory that a good story is only as strong as its antagonist. Johnny Quest had some of animation's best. Until your countrymen overran our Third Reich, I was a German officer. Kings of the Andean sky, strong, fearless, and free. I envy them. I know the enemies of my people. But Johnny, I am a nice guy. Unless you do not tell me where you find the Spanish doubloons. <laughs> 